Magic the Gathering has a starter deck problem. And I know Magic and Wizards of the Coast makes products specifically for new players and specifically to get people into the game. But I don't think that's all that starter decks are for. And I want to talk about it. So pull up a chair, have a seat at the table, and whether you're a button mash hack and slash controller bash or a meeple moving mastermind of maps, mats, and minis, if you ruffle at the awful riffle shuffle scuffle, or if you're a click clack pick attack number ball luck sack, we're all here for the same reason. I'm Jake. Let's talk games. So let's start off by talking about what a starter deck should do. Obviously, there's the basic introduction to the game. Starter decks are useful for people that don't know how to play the game or haven't really tried playing the game recently. It's a way for them to experience some of the simplified rules, understand the structure, and get a feel for how the game paces itself. This is really helpful if you're not sure whether or not you want to really dig into a game and maybe even try playing competitively. Magic has a few intro products that are designed for brand new players. In fact, some of them are designed for people that have never played any trading card games, and they're really good at getting that first step. But I think there's a second use for starter decks, and that's to introduce mechanics, introduce new strategies, and introduce archetypes and styles of play that you might otherwise not experience. A, a good way to look at this is the way that EDH decks are made, right? In Commander, you have these decks that are produced with specific archetypes in mind. So there will be a face commander. As an example, this starter deck is the Faceless Menace deck, which is the Morph Commander uh, with Cadena. And that entire deck is centered around Morph and playing creatures face down. And that's a mechanic that I don't think really sees a lot of play in modern or standard or vintage or legacy. So they made an EDH deck centered around that, printed a bunch of new cards that support that play style. And I think that brought it to the forefront. We actually saw a CDH tournament recently won by a deck that uses Morph as a core mechanic. And so it's a way to introduce people to some of these styles of play that they might not be that familiar with. However, there's no 60 card decks that do that. There's no other product that Wizards of the Coast makes to introduce people to styles of play outside of Commander. And I think that's a missed opportunity. So let's look at some of the products that Wizards of the Coast has made and then compare that to some of the products that other trading card games have made and compare that to some of the Commander products that Wizards of the Coast has made, and see if we can find a middle ground, a way that we would be able to make starter decks more accessible to new players, while still interesting to more enfranchised players. So let's take a step back and talk about the beginning, my beginning, of playing Magic the Gathering. Back in 1997, I had played Magic before, but I didn't own any cards of my own. And so the first product I bought was right after the release of Mercadian Masks. And that's these two deck boxes right here. We went into a card shop and my mom allowed us to each buy one deck, my brother and I. One of them is a pre-constructed deck. It's a 60 card deck using only cards from Mercadian Masks. And this one's a red black control deck. It has a couple copies of Snuff Out and a few other things that allow you to mess with your opponent. The other is a tournament pack. And for those of you that are somewhat new to this, a tournament pack is essentially three booster packs and 30 lands in a box together. It's 75 cards and it's completely random what you get. I had no idea what I was purchasing. So we gave the Disruptor deck to my brother and I had a random pile of junk. Um, but what we found is that those two decks played reasonably well against each other. And I think it doesn't speak highly of the pre-constructed decks that they are on par with a random assortment of garbage. If those are equal, your pre-constructed decks are not keeping up. This does not feed into any good standard decks. This is not a strategy that's workable for actually playing the game with friends. And I think it's disappointing to buy a pre-constructed deck 
and ask somebody to play the game and get repeatedly stomped because you are so far behind that you can't even compete. That was a bad starting experience, and I wouldn't recommend it. To bring it a little more up to date, this is the equivalent of the modern Planeswalker decks. Each one has a couple of rares in it, a bunch of bulk commons and uncommons, and really doesn't feed into anything useful in the standard or modern environment. Wizards of the Coast has made a couple of cracks at making better 60 card decks for those other formats. One of them is what I have here, the event deck for modern. When they were first pioneering modern, they ran into a similar issue that there was no real good onboarding ramp for modern. So they tried a couple of different things and this was a fully pre-constructed 60 card deck with sideboard, with sleeves, with dice, everything you need to get started. It was fairly expensive, <clears throat> between 30 and $40, but for a buy-in to modern, that's not bad. The problem was that this is a white-black token aggro deck, which isn't necessarily a problem, but white-black token aggro was budget to begin with. It was not putting up numbers on tournaments. The deck was okay. And it was a good way to get your toes wet in modern, but not a good way to actually compete. And then because this is a pre-constructed product, they had to scale it back even more so they could actually sell it for $30. So this wasn't even the budget version of the deck. It was maybe half of the budget version of the deck. So it had a few good cards in it, but it wasn't running play sets. It only had one sort of feast and famine. I think it only had three spectral processions. So it had gaps. It wasn't a complete deck so you couldn't pick it up and play in a modern tournament and even if you upgraded it you were still using a tier 2 or tier 3 deck in that modern tournament so that is also not a great experience for getting into the game so let's step away from magic for a second and look at how some of these other game systems specifically Yu-Gi-Oh and Pokemon have built out their starter decks structure decks for Yu-Gi-Oh battle league decks for Pokemon. They make a variety of products. But I think they all have a couple things in common. So let's walk through them one at a time and talk about the strengths and weaknesses. So let's start by talking about Yu-Gi-Oh. Now I started playing Yu-Gi-Oh back in 2002, right when it first released in English. I had the Yu-Gi starter deck, my brother had the Kaiba starter deck, and we were playing the worst version of that card game that existed. It improved over the years, and there was a large gap in which I didn't play at all. But recently, they've released a number of different products that are really good for getting started in the game. One of the things they released a little while ago was this Legendary Heroes box, and it was three fairly popular archetypes, and the versions that are in this deck are extremely slimmed down. They only introduced a couple of new cards in this box, and it's not actually enough to bring them up to meta. But you didn't have to add a whole bunch of cards to actually make the decks reasonably competitive. And they play well against each other. There's some interesting lines that are in here. I thought this was a cool product for someone looking to experience kind of the modern Yu-Gi-Oh situation. And for somebody that had been away for a few years, this was a really cool way to get back into it. More recently, structure decks or the name of the game. You go to any Target or Walmart or local game store around you, there's a bunch of them. And the way that they're set up is if you buy three of the same structure deck, you have enough to make a reasonably competitive deck for locals. It adds four or five new cards to the archetype to bring it up to be a little more modern. It has a number of reprints in it from older stuff that might be really expensive. I picked up my first play set of Ash Blossoms out of a trio of structure decks. And it's a really cool way to introduce somebody who's new to the game with a product that it also appeals to long-standing players. Uh, players that need some of those staples can pick it up in a structure deck. Players that are just starting out have everything they need in this box. But everything in the box is a one-of. So you buy a few copies of it to make sure you have three of your important cards. Or in some cases, you buy two copies of it and then use singles to fill out the rest. There's a variety of strategies, but it's extremely flexible and it gets you pretty close to whatever you would need to actually play at locals. I think that's a cool way of doing a starter deck. 
it's a good blend of satisfying older players while still introducing newer players. The only drawback is that because this is just a box of one-ofs, a new player may make the mistake of picking up one copy of the box and being disappointed at its lack of consistency and lack of power, not knowing that you really should buy three copies of it. But even then, you're only out about 30, 35 bucks for the entire deck, which is nice. Pokemon has been through a few changes. I have an old starter, not starter deck, but pre-constructed deck of Pokemon, and the way they used to structure the decks was terrible, just awful. In this box, I think the only final evolution that exists is for Alligator, is the title cover Pokemon. Inside, it has Larvitars and Pupitars, but it doesn't have a Tyranitar. You had to buy that separately. So it really feels like what you need to complete the deck is not included. And also, I don't know whether it's an old design philosophy or just an old way of playing the game. It's extremely light on supporters, items, any sort of other non-Pokemon cards. And so just deck design-wise, it doesn't play very well. It peters out really quickly. And if you get behind, you're just going to lose. There's no real way to come back from it. Pokemon's gotten a lot better about that. If you look at some of their modern starter decks or structure decks, they have a really good selection of playable archetypes of playable decks. The one that I have here, I threw out the box for this, but it is the Maridon EX starter deck. And I think I got this for 25 or $30, something like that. And it is playable right out of the box. It's a 60 card deck. And some of the cards that it includes in it, the first one here for Sealstone, I think is still going for seven or eight dollars. Then you have a variety of uh, V, V Max, EX Pokemon. You have the core of the rarity uh, of the rare cards that you need to make the deck function. Then it comes with full play sets of Ultra Balls, full play sets of Nest Balls. It comes with uh, a number of Professor's Research, a play set of Arvins, all of these special supporter cards that usually you'd have an issue finding every trainer that you need to make the deck function comes in the structure deck any adjustments that you make is pretty much the pokemon you pull out a few of the ones that are uh, basics but don't feed into the main strategy and replace them with multiple copies of your ex or v or v max pokemon and you have a workable competitive deck out of the box this is enough to play at any local tournament and I think that's really awesome. You don't have to put a lot of thought into it. So let's jump back over to Wizards of the Coast and the way that they make Magic the Gathering starter decks. I want to start by looking at commander decks and talking about the structure of those decks and what it does for the community at large. There's a variety of different commander decks that they make at different price points for different types of sets that they're being released in. For the most recent, the Fallout decks, those are generally a higher power level, a greater concentration of rares and mythics, a huge concentration of brand new, never before seen cards. And I think generally those exist in a state of their own. They're more expensive. They are sometimes harder to access. They're more of a specialty product. I want to look at just the commander decks that come out with the regular Magic the Gathering sets. So if we look at the sets, the decks that came out in March of the Machines and Lost Caverns of Ixalan or one of those other basic sets, the general composition is that about 20% of the deck, maybe a little less, are brand new cards. Between 15 and 20 cards are never before seen, printed fresh for that deck. And that's really important because it means that some of the veteran players that are looking for only new cards will still be interested in those decks and they'll still encourage them to buy into that new product. The other interesting thing about the way those decks are built is that anywhere from 30 to 40% of your non-basic land cards are at rare or mythic rarity. To put that into perspective, in a 60 card deck, instead of the two or three rares that we typically see in those starter decks, it would be if that deck came with 22 rares or mythics. So let's envision what our 60 card deck would look like 
if we used the structure that they use for commander decks. Essentially, we would have 24 lands, with between 4 and 8 of them being rare, color-fixing lands. So my go-to is the shock lands and maybe the check lands. So let's do four of each of those. And there are our 24 lands. Two color deck. A deck that I put together as an example of this, I call For the Birds. And it's a white blue bird themed deck. So now that we have our lands sorted, let's talk about the rest of our rares. If we have seven or eight of our rares in our lands, then we're looking for a good 12 to 14 other rares that we can include. I think because it's a 60 card deck, it's important that we include things at four of. Because nothing feels worse than getting a deck that has two or three copies of a card that's really useful for the strategy, and then a couple of one ofs that have nothing to do with the theme of the deck. To go back to the Disruptor deck, the whole deck is about controlling what your opponent can do. There's a lot of removal, a lot of burn, the rares are about dealing mass damage to the table and getting things off the board. But then there's a lot of things in the deck that are two ones and four twos with haste. And that's counterproductive when you have Thrashing Wumpus, which is essentially Pestilence on a 3-3 creature. So you have these kind of non-bows built into the deck. They don't work well together, the cards are bad, and you end up with a playstyle that just doesn't actually move to an upgrade of the deck. You, you, you immediately take out half of the cards that are in the deck if you want to make the deck better. So let's, let's try to avoid that. So for the remaining cards in our bird deck, let's look at birds that care about similar things. So uh, my go-to is something like Ledger Shredder uh, that gets plus one plus one counters, things that proliferate like Thrumming Bird. There's a lot of these overlapping cards with strategies that work well together. And adding a few of those at four of, so that way the people that buy the deck can see a through line for how to upgrade the deck. More things that add counters, more things that proliferate, more things that maybe control the board or care about flyers. And since we have that space of 12 to 14 additional rares, we can actually add some reasonably powerful stuff to it. Things like Brazen Borrower is really nice. And... Because we are using our format from the commander decks, we can print new cards. Maybe we have a, a blue-white bird lord on top of the blue-white cares about flying lord. And we can end up with a deck that also buffs it as you play additional cards. And so you get this compounding situation. Maybe we can use the airy that cares about birds dying and a different enchantment that works like bitter blossom, but for birds. And maybe instead of Bitter Blossom, you lose a life every turn. It's target opponent gains a life every turn. Well, now it's a better Bitter Blossom. It's a different Bitter Blossom, sure. But now, even in EDH, that becomes an interesting card. That does something different and unique. And so you're enhancing some of the formats that exist while also adding to this 60-card mishmash deck that you can play at a casual table that can get you interested in the game and introduce an archetype that otherwise doesn't have a good starting point. I think you can make a deck that encourages people to play 60 card decks again. The reality is, back in 2011, before they started releasing commander decks, it was kind of hard to build a commander deck. It took either a large collection, or you're building a very poor deck, or your circle of friends just didn't play it. I remember the first time someone asked me to come to a commander night. They said, hey, come on over. We're playing Magic. We play a lot of uh, Chaos. Uh, group play at the table with five or six people uh, but there's a caveat you have to build a new deck to play and that's a pretty big barrier of entry especially if somebody is already pretty heavily enfranchised and standard maybe only bought into that one competitive deck and doesn't have a library of other cards unless there's a pre-con that you can buy out of the box and play you might not be able to do that at all and so my hope is that moving forward we see more starter decks, more pre-constructed, ready-to-play, out-of-the-box decks. Because the reality is, when you walk into your local game store, and you look at the shelves of Magic cards that they're selling, you don't see any starter decks for anything other than Commander or brand new intro players. And I'd love to see that change.
because I like playing 60 card magic. I like playing casual, unique, weird decks that don't fit into the formats that we're already using. So I'm hoping that changes. And I hope more people try out some new ways of playing the game. And I hope you will too. Let me know if there's a deck that you've made that's way out of left field. How you would approach building a starter deck, introducing new people to your favorite archetype. It's been nice talking to you.